efficient hearing and I'm Good afternoon. A big thank you to the organizers for having given me this opportunity to interact with you on a topic that I knew very little about, but it gave me an opportunity to at least read up some of the stuff that I think is clinically relevant for us to know for years to come. So can I have my slides right? Okay. So if, you, if we go back 100 years almost to what Frederick Banting said when he received the Nobel Prize, he said insulin is not a cure for diabetes. It was a way by which we were treating our type 1 children and young adults, but in no way did it cure diabetes. So that understanding was very clear at that point of time. The previous topic was on bionic pancreas, so actually we now can start off from where my previous speaker left, that we have various kinds of so-called artificial pancreases now, in which way you have a sensing arm, you have a program which is there in the pump itself, an algorithm which is there, and then a delivery device. Now the delivery device can be a single delivery device, like only giving insulin and shutting it off. It can be a dual delivery device where you have insulin going in and glucagon going in because the, when the glucose goes down. And there is now a triple device with amylin as the third compartment. So, but with all said and done, you know, Technology is good, but we still haven't reached the kind of level that we would actually want to reach. So uh, my previous speaker has already talked about all of the possibilities and the pros and cons of this kind of bionic pancreas. The other thing that we had spent a lot of time in the last two and a half or three decades is, are you able to detect type 1 diabetes early enough? And if you are able to detect it early enough, if you go for various kinds of immunotherapy or modulatory therapy as well, can you actually do something about it? You know, it didn't turn out to be great and with a lot of side effects. Then came first the pancreas kidney transplant, followed by islet transplantation. Now we've realized that even that has limitations, but still the Edmonton protocol, which has been formulated in Edmonton, Canada, is still perhaps one of the best developments that we've had in type 1 diabetes in terms of islet transplantation. Now, the beta cells you're putting in somehow, whether in terms of islet transplantation or other, but there are various methods in which you can actually go for beta cell replacement therapies. The first, of course, was the pancreatic transplant. Then we talked about islet transplant. Then selective beta cell transplant, and I'm going to talk about stem cell therapy, the progenitor stem cells. Now, whatever I show or discuss here, we've got to remember, we are trying to be oversimplistic because the islet essentially is a microorgan. You know, just putting in the cells does not help. There is a permutation and combination of cells within it which acts as a functional unit both with local neurohormonal and paracrine interactions, which actually is the beauty of the islet as a microorgan. We still haven't managed that. Even at the end of the talk, I'll show you, this is not something that we've managed. We are only going to talk about stem cells. What are adult stem cells? These are undifferentiated cells that occur in differentiated tissues, that means Look at your liver, it's a differentiated organ, but there'll be some cells in it, for example, which are undifferentiated. These cells are able to make identical copies of themselves or something else as well. And they are able to yield specialized types of cells of tissues, mostly from where they originated, but they cannot go on replicating indefinitely. And if you look at the kind of stem cells that we have, I'll just skip this slide, just don't read what's written there, just think of what I've told you is that stem cells are there in every organ. When we were undergraduates, we thought, you know, it's, it's only bone marrow cells where you have the progenitor cells, you take that and you infuse that, that's where the stem cells are. No, it's there everywhere. And if you look at the kind of research that's going on, even for a missing tooth, people want to regrow a tooth. So you name it, 
people are trying it. So if we talk about stem cell therapy in diabetes per se, we are essentially talking about three kinds of origins or mechanisms by which we are talking about stem cells. The first is embryonic stem cells. Then there is induced pluripotent stem cells. And we are talking about adult mesenchymal stem cells. Of the three, I'm going to talk mostly about the one at the bottom because that's where probably the future is. And this is just a cartoon to try and show you what comes from where, but the next few slides will probably be more illustrative. So first, let us talk about embryonic stem cells. You know, just imagine an embryo. It has a potential to become an entire new organism. So this has unlimited plasticity. You take an embryonic stem cells, you can grow anything from that. But there are huge ethical concerns because you are taking a human pre-implantation embryo and then extracting those cells from there. It has ethical issues. Technically, it's very difficult. And you've got to remember, you are, all of us will remember when we first read about development of pancreas, maybe a little bit in embryology during anatomy days, and then later on when we talked about diabetes and other things, of all of those transcription factors. Now you take that cell, you have to treat it appropriately with these transcription factors so that it develops into a pancreas. So it's not easy. It's tough. And to get something which is, you know, you are going to make something on a scalable form, like for example, you have human insulin now, recombinant DNA technology. This is probably still very distant in that. And the yield is very low. Whatever you try, whatever you do. Now, and the other thing is that there is possibility of malignancies because whatever is there in that embryonic cell, you are trying to stimulate it, modify it, it will have the inherent properties of the source. But because of all of these stimulants that you are using and playing with the cell cycle, the risk of malignancy in these individuals is going to be high. The other issue is, now you, you, let us imagine you've made it and you're now putting it into your, the person who's getting it as a donor. There, the immune system of the individual is going to attack it because it's not having the same MHC class as you are having, and it's going to get destroyed. The other issue will be about the vascularity, development of vascularity in the cells that you provide. So for that, to bypass that, there's now a cap concept of macro encapsulation. I'll talk about that. And there's always that chance that, like I said, the malignant transformation. And I did try to look at the number of clinical trials that are registered. There are actually several trials that are registered, but there's only a one clinical trial that has actually been conducted, which has been done in type 1 diabetes to show that once you've given this, the hypoglycemia unawareness group of people, there has been some reduction in the insulin requirement. That's it. Nothing more than that. And that same company has actually registered for two more trials to see whether by macro encapsulation there's better vascularization of the graft and whether that works better. So as of now, embryonic stem cells still looks somewhere close to Pluto or Neptune. Let's look at the next one that is induced pluripotent stem cells. Now, a lot of us will remember when we were doing our MD and post-graduation, Dolly the sheep came up, and Yamanaka, whatever his name is, he got the Nobel Prize for it. So essentially, what they do is, they, they came up with this concept that you take any somatic nuclei, a cell that has a nucleus, and by subjecting it to various inducers, including certain microRNAs, recombinant proteins, you can transform that nucleated cell into any kind of other cell. So that could be transformed by inducing a pluripotent stem cell. That's the basic concept of induced pluripotent stem cell and its role in developing either a particular tissue. Particular, in fact, this is very popular now for skin grafts. Artificial skin grafts is induced pluripotent stem cells derived. And you can perhaps go into and make a pancreas. But the next slide will tell you 
it's not easy to make a pancreas or a beta cell. And you can see there are so many, you know, various factors in the correct manner, in the correct timing, you've got to go from here to there to pre create a mature beta cell. And this was a difficult process, particularly because, you see, pancreas has got an exocrine part, it has got an endocrine part. Even the endocrine part has got alpha cell, beta cell, gamma cell, epsilon, kappa, so many cells. So they were struggling. So they came up with certain promoters and certain inhibitors, which would block off the development into other pancreatic cells and help better of producing beta cell. And therefore, they have at least managed to do certain things. But again, this has the same problems. Number one, because you are going through so many inducible factors and inhibitory factors, the risk of malignancy is high. And secondly, because you are treating it in a culture media of so many things, it is very immunogenic. So once you put it into an individual, the chance of rejection is pretty high. So finally, we come to the third bit, which is the mesenchymal stem cells. And like I said, I always thought that most of the mesenchymal you know, stem cells that we talk about come from bone marrow. But now we know that almost in every organ, you have pericyte mesenchymal stem cells, which are outside the bone marrow. And the advantage of this second group of mesenchymal stem cells is that they come as a package. The stem cell is there, with it X, Y, and Z is there. That X, Y, Z cells has certain immunomodulatory effect, as a result of which that mesenchymal stem cell seems to be less immunogenic and more protected once you put it inside a host cell. So what essentially they do is they go for transdifferentiation of the mesenchymal stem cells into insulin producing beta cell. That complicated pathway that I showed, that again works here from the inducible pluripotent stem cells. But still, even after transdifferentiation, you know, it's not a very effective way by which you produce, you take 100, maybe you will come down finally to five, six cells, something like that. And if you look at mesenchymal stem cells and the number of clinical trials, 850 trials for various different things are there, of which there are about 12 or 15, which are related to diabetes, mostly type 1. And there's only one which completed the clinical trial in terms of transplantation of islet graft survival and function. And what most people have done is they have gone for islet transplantation. Along with that, they have put in mesenchymal stem cells to see whether the combo will actually work better. And what they have shown, this actually one of the first is already published. It reduced insulin requirement in the peritransplantation period, reduced decline of C-peptide level after six months, and lowered fasting glucose level after 12 months the co-transplanted reduced loss of the islet graft cell because they went and colonized where the islet cells were colonizing as well. And it was like a boost rather than it working alone. Additional studies and long-term observations are needed because this data is actually published in only three patients. That's the clinical trial of only three individuals. There are other abstracts and other publications of seven type 1 diabetes studies and eight type 2 diabetes studies. And the results are pretty heterogeneous rather than me being able to give you a really good summary. And there's been varying degree of partial improvement in glycemia. But one thing was clear in those studies in terms of indication. The ones who received it versus the ones who did not receive it, the ones who received had relatively lower diabetes-related complications. Now, all of us will remember that when we talk about pancreatic transplantation, there are studies to suggest there is reversal of diabetic retinopathy, there is reversal of diabetic kidney disease. So could this actually be reversing some of those things? Now, one of the things that I've already told you is, you know, this is not diabetes educator, by the way, is, is rejection of a graft, right? Here is now a concept 
what they are saying is, you know, before you put those cells into the body, if you separate the WBC and this, and then partially self-treat that with the patient's blood and leukocyte, there is kind of immune tolerance. So once you put it back in the recipient, the rate of reject rejection is low. As if you are the, the stem cells are getting educated about your immune environment. Excuse me, sir. So the other thing, just two minutes. Sorry, 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 sorry. Because it's too complicated for me to finish in 15 minutes. So the other thing that I was talking about is protecting the transplant. So there's a strategy of encapsulation strategy which looks something like this. So that, you know, there is, you're protecting it from the direct immune attack. The contents come out much more easily rather than the WBCs getting into the encapsulated compartment. And there are several other things which are going on, half of which I do not understand, maybe more than half I don't understand, of strategies that people are trying to do to improve things. So when we talk about beta cell from stem cells, how close are we? Insulin gene expression from these cells, we've achieved it. Insulin synthesis and processing from these cells, achieved it. Insulin packaged and storage in granules, that has been demonstrated. Nutrient sensing systems, so that you know the insulin comes out only when the nutrient is there, that has been achieved. Insulin and C-peptide release, yes, but receptor regulated insulin release, we haven't re achieved yet. Regulated uh, insulin intra-islet interactions, which I showed you at the very beginning about alpha cell, beta cell, and all of that, that hasn't happened. Regulated proliferative capacity. This is important because you're playing with God. So you have to make sure that you are, don't land up with malignancy. That we haven't got yet. So in type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes, if we look out at the future outlook, the ultimate goal is what you and I know, unlimited supply of insulin secreting cells that will not get destroyed either by immune me mechanisms and all of the other problems that I've already talked about. Finally, before I finish, do we really need in stem cells? Why not reprogram your alpha cells? Because in type 2 diabetes, at least we know that the beta cells become alpha cells rather than so-called beta cell failure. So you can, if you can re reprogram the alpha cells back to beta cells, that should be good enough. Thank you very much.